this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, in part because before I started actively working with financial services organizations, I was what you might call financially illiterate. In fact, I remember being in high school and complaining to my father that here I was in this, in the advanced math class, learning calculus, which felt ridiculously abstract, and yet I had no idea what it even meant to balance a checkbook. And that actually continued to be the case for about 20 years. Well after I had a bank account, well after I had a checkbook, well after I was paying bills and truly needed to understand the entire concept of financial literacy. Ooh. So I always thought that this entire process of learning more about finances really tied to what you learned at a young age. I thought that the easiest way to make sure that people understood how to deal with finances was through allowances, through getting them while they're young, right? But recently, as many of my friends have started to raise children, I've seen some challenges with that concept. So I'll tell you a quick story about my friend, Elon. Elon's four years old and he has a 25 cent allowance every week and he's very proud of it. He knows he can spend it if he wants to, but his parents are also encouraging him to save it. And so he has a piggy bank and once a week, Elon puts his quarter in his piggy bank and he'll tell you all about it and he'll, he'll show you his piggy bank and he'll tell you, you can shake it and you can hear all the quarters in there and he has so much money. And then about a week ago uh, during lunch, Elon got up to go play and his mom said, don't take your juice with you. And he didn't listen and he ran to the living room and he spelled his bright red grape juice all over the brand new $800 rug. And his mom may have overreacted a tiny bit and jumped up and went, grab the paper towels. We have to get, we have to get this. Anybody, should we, uh, do we use bleach or vinegar? And Elon says, mom, mom, don't worry. I'm gonna get a quarter out of my piggy bank and I'll buy the new rug. So, very sweet, very well-meaning. But there's clearly a bit of a gap here between this concept that 25 cents, you wanna save it, and how do we pay for an $800 rug? And again, this kind of threw me back to some of the conversations that I remember having as a, an 18-year-old planning for college and applying to private universities that cost $40,000 a year, and having serious conversations with friends about the difference between those and the state schools that cost $10,000 a year. And finally deciding, well, there's no way to ever pay any of that back, right? I mean, $10,000, I'd never even seen $1,000 in one place. When you're getting 25 cents in allowance, the gap to how will I pay back 10,000 or $40,000 they're exactly the same. And again, I had parents who did try to explain this to me, who had these conversations. And so it's maybe unsurprising that nearly two-thirds two two -thirds of Americans do not have what is considered to be basic financial literacy. That means that in a given room of 100 people, we're talking about 66 people who don't understand budgeting, can't necessarily work out how to pay their bills without ending up in deep debt, can't set about personal finance goals, don't understand finance-related topics. This is not an edge case. This is a pretty big deal. And I will caveat this with some of this may be about how do we measure financial literacy. Um, one of the more common measurements, which actually resulted in this two thirds um, statistic I'm sharing, comes from GFLEC, the Global Financial Literary, Literacy Excellence Center. And uh, I'm gonna take you through these three questions quickly. The first one is, suppose you had $100 in a savings account and the interest rate was 2% per year. After five years, how much do you think you would have in the account if you left the money to grow? Would it be more, less, or exactly $102? I see a show of hands. Who here says more? Who here says less? Who here says exactly $102? We had a couple in there for exactly $102. It is actually more. 
Second question, imagine that the interest rate on your savings account was 1% per year and inflation was 2% per year. After one year, how much would you be able to buy with the money in this account? Anybody want to shout out answers for this one? And do you think that the following statement is true or false? Buying a single company stock usually provides a safer return than a stock mutual fund. True or false? Very nice. I had to look up that last one. I got a little bogged down by, well, what kind of stock is it? What other stocks do I, oh, right, no, 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 no context here. Just take it straight from the question, right? So obviously there are some elements here. These are not asked in plain language per se. This assumes a little more than just an understanding of finance, but also an understanding of the vocabulary that we're using. And I did mention before that this isn't something that a lot of schools are are teaching. In fact, there are only five schools in, the, in five states in America that require a personal finance class in order to get a high school diploma. You might think that that's great news, right? Okay, we're rolling it out. It's in five states. Soon it will be all across the country. But it's actually not part of a dedicated rollout program. The five states just happen to be Alabama, Missouri, Tennessee, Utah, and Virginia. It's just coincidence. This is not something that we have a dedicated plan in place for. So before I go any farther, I will define what we mean by financial literacy, which, by the way, is another problem. There are myriad definitions for financial literacy across the internet. One that I thought really clarified where it's most valuable was this one, which was created by the President's Advisory Council on Financial Literacy in 2008. This definition is that financial literacy is the ability to use knowledge and skills to manage financial resources effectively for a lifetime of financial well-being. Okay, this implies that we have enough of an understanding to put aside money, to pay for the things that we need, to retire well, to care for our families. That seems great. But even with this definition that I think covers what is needed well, I have a couple of concerns. For example, referring to knowledge means that a lot of people are going to read this and think, okay, so it's correlated to how intelligent you are. Skills, okay, so how capable are you? In reality, financial literacy is much about the opportunities that you have and the resources available to you as it is about what you know and how capable you are. Let's take, for example, millennials. Now, full disclosure, I am a millennial. The millennial age range is typically counted as 1983 to 2000. That means that our youngest millennials are 18 years old, and our oldest millennials are in their mid-30s. So we talk about millennials often as though they're teenagers. But in reality, most millennials are in the workforce now. They're not frivolous. They're not unaware. But more of them are living with their parents than any previous generation. And there's been some, a lot of advice that goes out to millennials about how to get past this, how to improve your finances, how to really take care and get started saving and plan for retirement. In fact, Mark Cuban came out earlier this year saying that, the, you know how he became a billionaire? Anybody hear about this? Don't use credit cards. That's how he became a billionaire. Well, that's great when you've got $100 bills in your wallet. But if you're trying to build credit, Credit card's a pretty good way to get started on that. And of course, what he's getting at, and in the more detailed articles that came out about this, he was saying, by not using a credit card, he avoided credit card debt. And to his credit, credit card debt is, ooh, wow, uh, number three on the top three reasons that people are in debt. What it ignores, though, is that debt isn't always bad. If you have debt in the form of credit card, or an auto loan or student debt, you are probably paying that off. Now, if you are getting deeper and deeper into debt because of the interest rates, if you are moving towards bankruptcy, that's bad. But debt is not inherently bad. And yet we say to millennials, avoid credit cards. Don't get credit card debt. 
We also say to them, I'm sure many of you have heard this, stop wasting your money on frivolous things. You'd be able to buy a house if you just stopped buying that avocado toast, right? This one's been going around a lot. No wonder trust is a huge obstacle. No wonder more and more people are struggling to trust our financial institutions. We're ignoring the fact that they are paid lower than any generation before them, that rents are skyrocketing, that as Catherine said before, healthcare deductibles have gone up 125% in less than a decade. I love this comic uh, that shows a man who is trying to save money with a budgeting app. He says, this is amazing. It even makes a little graph showing me where I'm spending my money every month. So he's spending a little less than a quarter of his, of his monthly earning on rent, a little bit on food and savings, and the rest is going to frivolous shit to console me about my soul-crushing job and the general failure of my life. And he says, well, I should really close that savings account. What does it say about us as a community, as a culture, when we tell people that everything that isn't food and rent is frivolous. That's not a life. And Charles Schwab came out with a great article recently that simultaneously showed that yes, millennials are spending more than Gen Xers or boomers on taxis and Ubers, $4 coffees, clothes that I don't necessarily need, but more than a third of millennials have a written financial plan, which is more than boomers or Gen Xers. So, if we can safely say that the reason that people are struggling is not avocado toast and is not using the occasional credit card, what is the reason? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, it's a lack of understanding. For one thing, moving from debt being a problem to bankruptcy, the top causes of bankruptcy, medical expenses, reduced income, overuse of credit cards, divorce, emergency expenses, they all come down to needing to spend more than you have. Too little money, too many bills. And a lot of times that comes about because of a lack of understanding or knowledge or available resources. Not a lack of a plan, but a lack of a plan that can succeed. NPR said recently, research suggests that financial education may not lead to better financial choices. But that came after watching several different financial courses. And you know what most of those financial courses focus on? Compound interest. How to set up your retirement account. Do you know the last thing that you're thinking about when you're trying to figure out how to pay rent? Putting more money aside that you can't touch. It's great to say you should be saving more, but it's hard to figure out how. I spoke to a financial advisor at one point I remember this, walking into a room, and the financial advisor started off by giving me a nice, neat little piece of paper. It actually reminded me of the Goofus and Galland from Highlights. And it showed that essentially Goofus, uh, well, we'll start with Galland. Galland started saving when he was 20 years old, right out of college. Over the course of many years, Galland put $20,000 into his 401k. Goofus didn't start saving until five years later when he was 25. Goofus put $40,000 into his 401k over the same period of time that Gallant did. And yet, after 40 years, Gallant had plenty of money to retire, twice as much as Goofus. And the financial advisor was trying to explain, obviously, when you start earlier, if you can start when you're 20 or so, instead of when you're 25, this is, this is really, you can see the value of compound interest. And I said, well, I'm 30, so I guess I'm just screwed. <laughs> so what does that mean for us? What are the choices that we can make available? Is it truly that Americans just don't understand? Is it that millennials just don't get it? 
are we just in a position where short of a complete overthrow of our complete of our culture, our financial system, our healthcare system, and, and all of America, there is no way for anyone under the age of 80 to retire, ever? I don't think so. I believe that there are things that all of us in this room can do to improve the day-to-day -day situation and to help every single one of our customers to set themselves up for success and to succeed today. First of all, there are some programs in place from the federal level. Unfortunately, some of them are better than others. Uh, so, for example, in 2004, the Senate passed a resolution declaring April as Financial Literacy Month. Can I see a show of hands who knew that April was Financial Literacy Month? Five people. Good job, Senate. Good job promoting that. It's been the Financial Literacy Month for 14 years, and clearly word has spread. Good job. The, uh, the president, uh, President Obama in 2010 signed uh, an executive order creating the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability. In 2013, it was disbanded. So maybe we don't totally rely on the federal government to get us out of this. Then there are programs, um, organizations like GFLEC, which I referenced earlier. And they are creating a lot of opportunities to help further educate people. They do significant research into attitudes toward debt, uh, financial fraud in older Americans, um, how financially literate are women. They do tons and tons of, of research studies. And they're all available on their site, which is great. Um, and they also offer online personal courses and free resources and videos. And so this is a fantastic resource for anybody who knows it's there. Um, I'd love to see them getting some more marketing out there to help more people. But what does that mean for those of us in this room? Sure, you can send people to those existing resources. What about the resources that don't exist today? What about the things that you can be doing? Well, for one thing, we can speak in plain language. For anyone not familiar with XKCD, here we have, sure, 2% interest may not seem like a lot, but it's compound. So if you invest $1,000 now, in just 10 short years, you'll have, oh, let's see, $1,219. OK, so compound interest isn't some magical force. But that doesn't mean it's not valuable. It just means that when we throw out the word compound interest and expect people to magically be able to do the math in their head and understand why it was valuable or when it's the right time to rely on it, maybe instead we need to offer a little more detail. Maybe we need to be defining AML, ACH, APM, CMP, EFT, KBA. Maybe we need to not just ask for a routing number, but actually, as Ally Bank does, actually, show where it is on your check and how to find it. Maybe we need to define what a certificate of deposit is. Or when we say you will get an overdraft fee, maybe instead say, if you spend more than is in your account right now, you will receive a fee. This is called an overdraft fee, right? We can explain these things and help people understand consequences as well as opportunities without relying on the jargon that is inherent to our industry. We can also focus on finance as a tool. The value of money is not in having it. We are not trying to get millennials to be Scrooge McDuck. We do not want people to ultimately have these lovely vaults where they can swim in gold. What we want is for people to understand that, hey, you have choices. Some credit cards have zero interest for the first year. Some credit cards give you rewards benefits. When you make a choice between those, you need to pay attention and be aware if there's a fee coming up. You need to take notes on this. You need to have a place where you can easily go back and check. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's not a bad thing to get a new credit card. It is a bad thing to not pay off one, right? We need to go into details here. We need to help people to make choices that are actually available to them now, rather than just speak to the pie in the sky. Because as you heard, 
in the, uh, in the panel earlier, we know that people make choices based on convenience. But I don't want to overlook the fact that it's not as though people are ignoring what would be best for them. Everyone in this room has chosen to buy a coffee out rather than make coffee at home. And maybe some days it's because the extra couple bucks isn't that big of a deal. But some days it might be because you've got 80 different things on your plate today. And if you miss getting to that first meeting, then your job is in jeopardy. Or maybe it's because you have to do networking and it's assumed that you'll get coffee during that. These are the choices that people have to make. And so rather than blame them or simply try to remind them of what they should do, we need to help them and give them opportunities and give them value and give them choices. We want them to save appropriately, not merely save. And we want them to invest safely, not merely invest or rely on them to magically know what investing is and how it works. And most of all, we need to design the conversation. We need to meet people where they are. It is up to us, the designers in this room, the financial planners in this room, the financial wellness people in this room, it is up to all of us to understand our customers, to give them the benefit of the doubt, to recognize their goals as valid and their barriers as real. And it is up to us to rely on financial literacy as something that we need to improve, not something that they can magically have. We need to do this so that the four-year-old can become a 14-year-old who understands how quarters can become $1,000. And the 14-year-old can become an 18-year-old who understands the value of a $40,000 uh, versus a $10,000 investment. And so that the 18-year-old can become a 35-year-old who can do their own budgeting. And the 35-year-old can become a 65-year-old who can maybe not have exactly the savings and exactly the retirement that we would dream of for everyone, but will know that their financial institutions are there to help them and to continue to be, with the, to be there with them throughout every step of their life. Thank you very much. Marley, we've got time for uh, one question here. <clears throat> Great. <laughs> are we naive to think financial companies want consumers to be more literate? Do you think they are solving this and why? That's a great question. Um, so financial literacy can cover so much. Um, there are situations where too much information is overwhelming, but by and large, if you rely on customers to be, I'm not saying that there aren't organizations out there. There are too many negatives in the sentence. There may be organizations who would prefer that their customers uh, stay financially illiterate. You may be one of them. But overarchingly, your company is also probably noticing that the um, customers who are less financially illiterate are not using your services as much. And although you, know, you may get the $25 overdraft fee from them, you're not getting the additional finances from the investments and from the retirement planning and from you, the use of your tools. So overarchingly, if your organization has a strategy and or has any interest in having a strategy for long-term relationships that ultimately result in profits for the company, they will want customers who A, trust them, which comes with literacy and transparency, and B, uh, should I say one and B, know what's going on and what their options are. So I'm happy to talk about that uh, more later. The reason I say it's complex is that then there's the whole financial security and there's all, it's all kinds of stuff. So um, it's a great in-depth topic, whoever, whoever asked that. That's a great Thank question. you, Marley. Thank you, guys. <laughs> 